Gaming is a huge part of my life. I remember spending my earlier days playing the Modern Warfare series with my brother on a flimsy PlayStation, oftentimes in complete awe at the pure adrenaline field and action-packed set pieces offered to us. Most of my time in middle school I spent in anticipation, waiting for the moment I could come home and log on to Minecraft with my friends. In high school, I spent my freshman and sophomore years without a job like my friends had, instead coming home to sit back, relax, and play Counter-Strike like an idiot. Those times, to me anyway, were the good days, my own golden age of gaming. But just as I've grown up and changed the way I play, so have the video games and their developers. Unfortunately, this change is a negative one, and it's being felt by more than just me. So today I'm going to be addressing two big issues within the gaming industry. One, unplayable, incomplete, or broken games, and two, intrusive microtransactions. Because in essence, being unaware of these problems and supporting poor development practices such as these may over time lower not only your value as a consumer, but the value of other players worldwide. So first up, we have unfinished or broken games. Let's take a look at some examples. Battlefield 4 upon launch, a full price, $60 AAA developer title. But what do we get? A rushed release, full of bugs and glitches with some absolutely awful netcode. People getting shot around corners, random hit markers, physics glitches, and more. Dishonored 2, its predecessor having won quite a few awards for quality and gameplay. The expectations were high with this one. They weren't quite met, however, as the PC port was released with horrible performance issues, making it hard to play properly, even on powerful hardware. Remember that these games were $60 at launch. Assassin's Creed Unity was also released into a pool of controversy, and basically became a landmark for unplayable games. Between the brilliantly unfinished, glitch-ridden game with hardly any properly working features and the launch day review embargo, it's pretty obvious that this game was rushed to release with little confidence on the developer's part. The game was so broken Ubisoft had to compensate players for even trying to play. Almost all of these issues were fixed later, and came in the form of patches or updates. Which brings me to my next examples. Missing content. Let's look at No Man's Sky and Destiny, both games about exploring star systems, very ambitious and with the promise of vast amounts of content. Whether you like these games or not, they're undeniably missing content that should have originally been in each game. No Man's Sky has an entire list of content promised in interviews with the lead developer that just weren't there when the game came out. If some of you recall, the developer basically disappeared after the launch date, but for many the damage was already done. According to VGCharts.com, around 300,000 people in the US alone had pre-ordered No Man's Sky, and that doesn't take into account any digital sales. Similarly to Assassin's Creed, no press copies were sent out for reviews ahead of release, which just goes to show the unconfidence of the developers. And lastly, Destiny, a game that promised to be revolutionary, became a mess. Through a rough development process and pressure from Activision to rush out the game, entire chunks of story, dialogue, and cutscenes were cut from the game, and as one Bungie employee suggests, it would be resold as downloadable content, or essentially, macro transactions, later. This left players with a disappointingly vague story and not much content for the price. Now consider everything I've just mentioned. The games, the promises, the performance, the disappointment. Is that what your hard-earned money is worth? If you buy a game, shouldn't you get a complete game? Of course, a few mistakes and errors are to be expected, but when it gets to the point where it seems like things are slipping right past the creators that shouldn't, right before releasing a full product for a hefty sum, why are they getting your money? This is exactly why I think gamers should avoid pre-orders or day one purchases on video games nowadays, and instead wait for reviews to form a less compulsive and more informed decision. Because if a developer or publisher already has your money, they won't allow pre-release reviews, and they're maybe not entirely passionate about the project they've been working on, then that's potentially even less incentive for them to make their game the best that it can be, a game worth its own price tag. This ultimately comes back to the kind of person who will buy the game in the first place. I can say from personal experience that today there are too many people who are willing to just dish out their money on the next big thing, only to regret it later. And speaking of regrets, Microtransactions. Now I know what some of you are thinking, not this again, microtransactions are fine, how are developers supposed to make money? You can ignore them, but just hear me out. I am not fundamentally opposed to the presence of microtransactions in video games, I'm just against intrusive ones. But what makes a microtransaction intrusive? Now for those of you who don't know, according to Wikipedia, a microtransaction is a business model where users can purchase virtual goods via micropayments. You've probably seen these in at least a few of the games you've played recently. They often take the form of loot boxes, secondary currencies, cosmetic items, consumables or boosters, locked items, and can either be paid for with real-world money and in-game currency, or real-world money alone. While researching the topic, I came across a new website called Lootbox Watch, which provides information on the presence of microtransactions within games and ranking them based on their intrusiveness. After reading through each level's description, I agree wholeheartedly with how they categorize each game. 
Cosmetic items found in the loot boxes of Overwatch and the battle packs of Battlefield 1 do not affect gameplay in any way. They're simply skins and camos for characters or guns, which make the presence of these microtransactions non-intrusive. If you've had your fair share of internet surfing in the past month, you've probably heard the public outcry following the release of Star Wars Battlefront 2. It was pretty bad. Being the only game under the extremely intrusive category, it has essentially raised the bar for just how bad microtransactions can get. I won't go through the trouble of explaining it in full detail here, but the problem with Battlefront 2 is essentially that the progression system is a convoluted mess made only to hide the fact that the gameplay is centered around purchasable currency. The simplest example I could give you is that if I were to purchase crystals, the premium currency in the game, I could buy loot crates which will randomly give me upgrades that give an unfair advantage over other players who don't have these upgrades. Upgrades such as extra health or weapon damage directly affect the gameplay. So in the end, players are encouraged to spend more money to progress and perform better. My point here is that the microtransactions have formed a sort of paywall, in which a player's payment is directly tied to their progression, gameplay, and overall enjoyment of the game. This behavior replicates that of a free-to-play mobile game. But that's not what came in the package, is it? What came in the package was a AAA title from a developer renowned for its games, ranging from $60 to $80. So why is it that the game you paid for leaves you with the same two choices that a free mobile game does? Spending the hours of a work week on a repetitive grind before being allowed to have more fun, or just paying your way through that obstacle? Is your wallet feeling offended yet? Let's take a look at Grand Theft Auto Online. In my opinion, this is the best current example of the subjectivity when it comes to microtransactions, because while some people can't tolerate the amount of input required for their own satisfaction, others are totally fine with working for it. Grand Theft Auto's microtransactions quite literally intrude your game, as they start with a phone call. The caller urges you to buy bunkers, hangars, operation centers, and all this extra stuff new players like myself do not have the money for. These facilities can be used to start new missions and unlock new vehicles, effectively increasing the amount of game available to play. So clearly, the next step is to earn some money, right? The answer is yes, but for a game about stealing things and running businesses, making money sounds easier than it actually is. From what I've gathered online, the minimum time required for the average player to obtain a million dollars is around 7 to 10 hours. According to a spreadsheet made by user ExiledGamer0, GTA has 82 vehicles in total that cost over $1 million, and with exact pricing considered, come out to a whopping $194,541,000. If I spent 7 hours making a million dollars in a legitimate way, I'd have to spend around 1,362 hours to get all 82 fancy cars. Or I could just spend $2,431.76 of real-world money to bypass all of that. I don't think either of those things are going to happen on my end, but considering how much money Rockstar is raking in, it's clear that some people are willing to pay the price. So I ask again, why should another full price title paid for with your hard earned money give you only two ways to play? Work for it like you work at school and or your day job, or fork over some more of that sweet sweet cash. To be clear, I don't want to discourage anyone from paying any more for a game after the starting price. There's plenty of extra content out there worth buying and supporting good developers for. The problem with all those games I just mentioned is that no matter how you feel about it, if those particularly intrusive microtransactions are supported, and if buying an incomplete game is considered alright, that sends a signal throughout the industry harming the rest of us who aren't willing to pay our way through a game. It gives game companies the green light for employing cheap money-making tactics and using what we call pay-to-win models. It lets them know that it's okay to rush their new games out the door with little attention. The possibility of future video games being dominated by these tactics is worrying, not just because the initial price of most games nowadays are arguably the highest they should be, but also because there's a potential rippling effect throughout industries outside of video gaming. It sends a message, one that says, go ahead and raise your prices, go ahead and ask for even more money, because as consumers we'll pay for anything that comes our way. Incomplete, unusable, unreliable, and disrespectful to our value, we'll pay for it. One that says, price is not an issue, even in the absence of value. But I know those words aren't true, at least not for everyone. We've seen the public fight back before. Just look at Battlefront 2. The backlash following those shady microtransactions resulting in the most downvoted comment of all time on Reddit, causing EA to remove their premium currency altogether, at least for a while. This shows that consumers have a voice and need to use it. In a greedy world, our money speaks volumes, so we're left with a choice. A choice I implore you to consider. A choice to not hop on board the hype train and pre-order the next big thing before knowing how it's gonna be. A choice to do your research before making a purchase. A choice to see support for those who only want more and hardly give more. A choice of patience over irresponsibility, of making your time and money count. A choice of being that change you want to see in your world. 
and a choice to say that price is always an issue, especially in the absence of value. Thank you.